Senator Joni Ernst from the great state of Iowa. Senator, good morning. Always good to talk to you. Oh, great to be with you, Hugh. Thank you. Uh, Senator, in the fall, you won your election pretty handily. By how many points? It was over six, closer to seven. All right. So I, it was a big handy win. The reason I bring that up is this weekend I was sitting down with friends going over the list of people who are being mentioned for the 2024 presidential election. I, and I finally said, you know, Joni Ernst has got to be on this. Have you ruled out running for president in 2024? <laughs> I will not be running for president in 2024. My commitment to the state of Iowa and, and my constituents there is stronger than ever. And and uh, I've still got work to do in the Senate, Hugh. So you're not ruling, you're just not going to do I, it? You know, nope, just not not going to do it. I think we've got a lot of colleagues that are looking at that and, and have aspirations uh, to seek the office of president. But I, uh, once again, I'm just very committed to my constituents in Iowa and want to make sure that we're doing the right thing for them. Okay. Next time you get out, you should not going to do it. Wouldn't be prudent. That would be perfect. Uh, so Senator, I, I, I want to go to two big things, the impeachment and COVID relief. I want to start with impeachment. I believe you voted not to proceed. Do you believe these proceedings are unconstitutional? I absolutely do believe that they are unconstitutional. We have a, a trial that's being targeted at a private citizen right now sitting in the state of Florida. I don't believe this is the right thing to do. And certainly, if the Democrats want to proceed with it now, uh, what's to stop in the future any other impeachment proceedings going against any other former president? Now, there has been uh, upheaval on former President Trump's legal team. To me, the best legal defense is a one-line letter. Uh, these proceedings are unconstitutional and I shall not be participating. What would you think of such a defense? Well, I think that that is the greatest defense that we have on our side is that it, it simply is unconstitutional, bottom line. That's, so I would agree with that. Now let's go to COVID relief. Uh, you are not in what is being called the Collins and Company 10, and that's only what Punchbowl called it this morning. Is that because you don't like their approach or because they only needed 10 to get to the magical 60 for non-reconciliation uh, filibuster proof. Why are you not part of that 10? Because I generally consider you to be one of the people that Democrats can work with very easily. No. Well, and actually, Hugh, I was just visiting with uh, Lisa Murkowski over the weekend and had texted her this morning. I am largely supportive of their plan, and I, I will support it. It focuses quite heavily on vaccine uh, distribution, making sure that we are developing it. It does have my child care plan. Uh, in it as well. So there, I am supportive of the package. We continue to gain momentum with Republicans. The important thing is to show that as Republicans, we do have follow-on plans for COVID-19. What the Democrats are trying to portray is that we have no plan. We need to proceed with Bernie Sanders' budget resolution so after that, they can tack on reconciliation and pass anything they want with 51 votes. And we can't allow that. We still do have additional work to, to do in the area of COVID-19, but it really does have to be a targeted, focused plan. So, yes, large in part, I am very supportive of this. I appreciate that so many people have been working so hard on this. So the 10 is a floor not a ceiling of gop support it is absolutely the floor it continues to grow and the 10 that have been working on this package and you know i've i've worked on different pieces of it large in part the child care portion uh, that has been included uh, but it is the floor and we do continue to see momentum grow um, again going through the package it's focused on k through 12 schools child care um, direct COVID pandemic response, again, with vaccinations. Um, there is a small portion um, that is focused on nutrition as well, making sure that our families have support in, the, in their food systems. And there's also behavioral health support, which is really important. Um, so there's a lot of really great stuff in the package, um, but it's certainly not the $1.9 trillion that's being proposed by Biden and the Democrats. What is behavioral health support, Senator? Well, it is providing the funds necessary to bolster uh, behavioral health supports in the state. 
A lot of the states already do have programs in place, and this will further grow that out. But what we have seen certainly through the pandemic is um, those that, because of isolation, have just further and further fallen behind in their behavioral health. Um, we have seen suicides. We have seen abuse growing within the home because there's not the outlets of schools and work and so forth. So these are important aspects that we really need to focus on as well and make sure that not only uh, with the vaccinations we're focusing on physical health, but that we're also taking care of mental health. And I would say in a lot of cases, too, we want to make sure, and this isn't part of the plan, but, but also spiritual health. This has been a very difficult year. We're not through it yet. Uh, we want to make sure that people know that there are resources available if they are struggling with mental health or behavioral health. Uh, Senator, the homelessness crisis in California, where I am and will be for a couple more months, is out of exponentially worse than I have seen in my 30 years in the state. Are there funds for that? Would that come under behavioral health? Well, not specifically for homelessness. But certainly then those um, in those populations would be able to uh, utilize those services. So, yes, it, it is not just for um, stabilized families. It is for anyone who would need those resources. And we certainly know that large in part with the homeless population, there is um, mental illness, there is substance abuse, and all of those issues could be treated through this behavioral support package. You mentioned the child care aspect. Again, I'm not sure what the details are. Can you expand on that? Yes, and this is additional dollars that will go out the door for um, block development grants for child care centers. Um, Iowa is a prime example because we have so many child care deserts, meaning that there are uh, vast areas where we don't have child care centers or they are closing because moms and dads have been out of work um, because of COVID. So they're not taking their children to those child care centers. Those child care centers can't survive. So they close their doors, many of them permanently. What we need to do is get them reopen again, because as our economy is opening up and jobs are becoming available, moms and dads need to have a safe place to take their children. Otherwise, it's that chicken or the egg, you know, cycle uh, that we have to break out of. So we certainly need to get these doors back open. That's what these child uh, development block grants can do. Um, as well, it helps provide cleaning supplies and other safety measures for those child care centers to make sure that not only the children are safe, but then also those child care workers are safe as well. So finally, Senator Ernst, you served with uh, Vice President Biden when he presided over the Senate. He's now the president. Do you expect him to actually sort of revert to Senate form and the give and take that marked his almost 40 years as a member of or a presiding officer in the Senate? Well, Hugh, you know, the the president was out there stumping about bipartisanship and so forth. But what I have seen exhibited so far in this presidency is say one thing, do another and we've seen that with a number of his executive actions so far, just rolling back virtually everything that President Trump had done in his tenure in office. Um, we see him trying to move forward with some of these ideas, you know, and start establishing a commission to reform the courts. And, and he's politicizing everything that has been good in our nation's history. So it's really unfortunate that he's saying one thing, but his actions are just totally going a different direction. And I just I feel that maybe, you know, maybe he'll prove us wrong. But I think he duped a lot of voters. Now, Senator, reforming the courts, I can understand how reconciliation could be twisted to spend money and to raise taxes. I don't think it can survive the bird rule to expand the courts. Do you? We hope not, but this is what we do take a look at is Democrats are so hungry uh, to gain power in the United States Senate. And as AOC has said in the House, you know, we, we don't want bipartisanship. 
You know, we want full authority. We want to roll over everybody. You know, if they continue down this path in the Senate and uh, get rid of the bird rule, um, if they start moving towards eliminating the filibuster, if they can uh, put enough pressure on Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, uh, they will have full reign and control over the direction of our nation. And uh, the Senate has a, a long history of bipartisanship. We've tried very hard. We hope it stays in place. So, you know, yes, the question is still out. Uh, we hope that our friends and allies stand strong on the filibuster, but, you know, they, they can change that. They can. They can over, overrule the parliamentarian and, and do as they wish. Well, the bird rule hadn't occurred to me as being something that they might roll over. Do you believe Senators Manchin, Cinema, and I don't know, is there a third or a fourth moderate? Will they stand as tall on the bird rule as they have on the filibuster? Well, we are hopeful. They have not been as outspoken on the bird rule. But yes, this is a concern of ours. Not only is the filibuster a concern, but the bird rule is also a concern because they could overrule. Um, they could make that decision to roll over us. Again, ending you know what has been decades and decades of bipartisanship and agreement in the Senate, they simply could eliminate. Would that trigger what Senator Leader McConnell said would be the uh, the desert of the Senate, the refusal to have a quorum? Is the is the bird rule one of those things around which the procedural nightmares begin if they invoke any kind of attempt to change yes. it? I, and I do believe so, Hugh, and I think that that is very unfortunate. Uh, but in order to stop them from proceeding, you know, with a threshold of, of 51 votes or including things that have long been prohibited um, by the bird rule, then uh, it could trigger just this expanse of not getting anything done in the United States Senate, which simply would block all the work that, that Congress is doing. And, and we really don't want to see that. We do want the Democrats to be good partners to us. But simply forcing things through, you know, in what should be appropriations bills or otherwise um, that has generally been prohibited in the past, it's not the right way to do business. The Democrats do need to work with us on this. On that note, Senator Ernst, keep coming back. Thank you. That was very clear.